So I would like to, before passing to the subject of today's talk, I would like to make one more reminder of the main counting result of the previous two talks. So the theorem is here, and it says that for any rational multi-curve, if you prefer for any simple closed curve, gamma, and for any hyperbolic surface x in MGN, the number of closed, simple closed geodesics of topological type gamma, for example, separating or non-separating, uh, of length at most L, has polynomial asymptotics, where the power of polynomial is like this, and the coefficient decomposes in the following way. It's Thurston's measure of unit bold measured in terms of the hyperbolic metric x times coefficient which depends only on gamma divided by coefficient which is just the average measure of unit balls with respect to all hyperbolic metrics in MGN. So the only dependence on hyperbolic metric is hidden here. It's Thurston's measure of unit ball. The dependence on topological type of gamma, for example, dependence whether we choose separating uh, simple closed geodesics or non-separating simple closed geodesics is hidden in this coefficient. And this is universal coefficient. And actually, as I mentioned, this is also Mazurovich volume of the principal stratum of uh, meromorphic quadratic differentials on surfaces of genus G with n poles. Uh, and this theorem has immediate corollary. If you take two different topological types, for example, if you are interested in counting separately, separating simple closed geodesics and non-separating closed, simple closed geodesics, then asymptotically their frequencies of simple closed geodesics of type gamma 1 and of type gamma 2, so their the ratio of these quantities, which is sort of the, shows how frequently we see ones with respect to another, does not depend on the hyperbolic metric. Because when we divide this quantity by similar quantity where we replace gamma 1 by gamma 2, so the only thing which survive would be this coefficient. So the ratio depends only on, topo on topology. Geometry disappears in this answer. For any hyperbolic surface, the frequencies are the, for all hyperbolic surfaces, the frequencies are the same, given that we fix genus and number of functions. And yesterday, after the talk, I was asked whether I proved the theorem. Yes, I did. <laughs> and I would like to remind her, of, well, I would like to remind what was the proof. Considerable part of the proof was just interpretation of our counting problem in terms of Thurston's and Mirzahani's <coughs> measures on the space of measured laminations. So recall that this is our counting function. The number Sx of L gamma is the number of simple closed geodes geodesic multicurves of fixed topological type gamma on hyperbolic surface X and of length at most L. B of X is the unit ball in the space of measured geodesic in the space of measured laminations associated to given hyperbolic metric? And I apologize. Sometimes I write, write b of x is sometimes b with substrate x. It's sort of I switch from one notation to another following Mariam. Uh, now, mu gamma is Mirzahani's measure on the space of measured laminations. It does not use hyperbolic metric. And basically, this measure is constructed using the integer points in the orbit of gamma under the mapping class group. So it's sort of vaguely you can imagine this as analog of all co-prime points in R2, uh, in Z2, which is sub-lattice of larger lattice. and Thurston's measure on the same space is constructed using all integer points in ML. So here we use only subset. And important observation, which is one of the 
key, well, one of the key points of the proof is that the two measures, these two measures, are proportional, and I'm not proving it, but I'm indicating what were the key ingredients of the proof, which is very short, actually, is that both measures by construction are invariant under the action of mapping class group, plus we have ergodicity result of Howard Mazur uh, saying that Thurston's measure is ergodic, and also clearly Thurston's measure dominate, dominates Mirzahani's measure because one measure is constructed using all integer points and another only part of this integer points. So the only thing which is not obvious from here is why this coefficient k gamma is non zero, and we'll see it in a second. So now, what is the proof? To prove this theorem, we can divide this quantity by L in this power, and we have to prove that this limit of the ratio exists. Now it is sufficient to realize that this quantity, the inter to, to use interpretation of this quantity of this number of simple closed geodesics of topological tie gamma of length at most L on the surface X, is the number of points of the orbit of the mapping, mapping class group uh, applied to gamma, which get into its si get inside their ball of radius L. And so this quantity is the same as this quantity. Now the ratio, when we take the ratio and when, pa when we pass to the limit, we get by definition, this is exactly the definition of Mirzahani's measure of the unit ball. And we know that it is proportional to Thurston's measure of the unit ball. So with, with, with some coefficient k gamma, which we do not know yet, which we have to compute. But look, we already, just with this interpretation, we already proved existence of the limit. We already see that the limit exists. And we already see that this limit has this form. So basically, the only thing which I have to prove is that this quantity is exactly our k gamma. Hmm? You have, you've got an integrate function, yeah. Sorry? So, f do we have objection for this equality? No, I'm talking about the You are here, but you, you, are, you are rushing forward. Wait a bit. Greg, we're not there yet. Wait a bit. Do we have objection for this equality? Do we have objection for this equality? Sorry? It cannot be plus infinity. It cannot be greater than one. Because one measure is dominating another. So the only trouble which, which you can have is that the constant can be zero. We're, we're coming. Wait a bit. Don't be in a hurry. Don't rush. So it remains to prove that this constant is equal to this ratio. And then we complete the proof of the theorem. Any objections? I have a So the constant is constant almost surely, right? I mean, in terms of your, what no. you get from the main So the, really the best comparison is all integer points in R2 and co-prime points in R2. Do we agree that if we construct two measures using one lattice and the other lattice, we obtain two Lebesgue measures, which are proportional with a constant, which is 1 over zeta of 2. So our k gamma is analog of this 1 over zeta of 2. No, 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 but I understand the k gamma is a number. Yes. But in terms of when you use the Maser ergodicity, yes. I mean, a priori is a function of x, and then ergodicity tells you that it's a constant function of x. As a function of x, it's a constant. Right. I do not see x in Mazur's ergodicity result. It does not use hyperbolic metric. We are working with measured laminations and, and speaking and discussing measures. We at any point, so when, when we are comparing the Lebesgue measure constructed using all integer points in R2 
and co-prime points in R2. Are there any concrete set in this consideration? No. There are no balls, nothing. No balls, no ellipses. We're comparing two measures. We're putting atomic, well, OK. So now we have to compute this constant. To compute this constant, I, so I do use the result that the integral of Thurston measure over MGN, which is denoted by BGN, so this integral converges and we get some non-zero finite number. Greg, and here I am cheating, I'm not proving it. I'm not proving that this integral is converging. I, wait, do you expect me to prove all the details in two, two hours? I'm, no, no. If I would be able to do this. Mm. So I'm using this as a black box. So I claim that this integral converges and gives some fixed number, some well-defined positive number. So k gamma times BGN is equal to this quantity just because it's definition of BGN. BGN, it's integral of Thurston's measure with respect to MGN. I just multiplied both sides of this equality by k gamma. Now, I'm using that k gamma times Thurston's measure, no matter what is inside. For it's, it's not property of, of the argument of which is here. Just Thurston's measure is proportional to Mirzahani's measure with coefficient k gamma. So I'm using this equality, which is equality for measures. It's not equality of measures of some individual sets. It's property of measures. Two measures are just proportional, like measure coming from co-prime points is proportional to measure coming from all integer points with coefficients one over z, which, with the coefficient one over z, z to of two. So by definition, what we have here is Mirzahani's measure of Bx. Now, by definition, Mirzahani's measure of Bx is this quantity. We have seen it in, yeah, in this equality. We already discussed this. So, by definition, this is, sorry. So, it's, we, we discussed it in this equality, except that I'm going backwards. So, I'm using this equality here, and now I'm using this equality here. So, this quantity, this cardinality of number of points of the orbit of mapping class group of gamma, which get to a ball of radius L, is exactly our counting function Sx of L gamma, divided by this. Now I'm using technical result, which I discussed at any point. But at some point, Mirzahani proves that this ratio, which depends on L, is uh, bounded from above by some function which depends only on x which, and which does not depend on L anymore. And this function F capital is integrable over MGN. This is, this shows that it is legitimate to interchange the integration with the limit which should be justified, absolutely. This is sort of a constant source of mistakes. So at this point, if this is not justified, you can get, you can obtain marvelous results. <laughs> and completely wrong. So here, however, due to this technical estimate, it is legitimate to interchange limit and integral. So we place, uh, sorry, not limit, uh, this division and limit. And we can, we can pass to, to this integral. Now, we have seen that this quantity was our average number of geodesic multicurves of type gamma of length at most L, average with respect to all hyperbolic surfaces um, in MGN. And we have seen, due to this trick with passing to the space of bordered hyperbolic surfaces and to, to discover and knowing that volumes of spaces of bored hyperbolic surfaces are polynomials in L, and this is beautiful result of Mirzahani, non-trivial. So we're using this result here. We know that this is a polynomial in L, 
of degree 6g minus 6 plus 2, 2n. So this limit is just the coefficient of top uh, term of this polynomial. We denoted it by C gamma, and we have seen that since this polynomial is expressed in terms, the coefficients of this polynomial are expressed in terms of uh, Mirzahani's Weil Peterson volumes of bordered hyperbolic surfaces, of moduli spaces for bordered hyperbolic surfaces, it is computable. So, and it was denoted by C gamma. Now, we have proved that K gamma times BGN is equal to C gamma. We have proved this. End of the proof. I used two black boxes, but otherwise I've proved the theorem. Do we agree now? Well, I, sorry? Uh, up to, well, up to this, up to conversions of this integral, but otherwise, Okay, so that was their brief sketch of the proof of this main counting result. And now I would like to pass to, to Fanny's so because, so I was very serious during two lectures and uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. I would like to, so you're, usually you're supposed to be tired after two weeks of the school, so let me tell you some funnies. And I suggest to count meanders. So meander is, well, it's meander, usually speaking about meanders when imagine a river, but my river is closed. You see? So I have a simple closed curve in R2, transversely intersecting a horizontal red line, so red line is sort of a highway, and the question is how many meanders you can find, and this question is, well, was posed long ago, uh, according to Landau and Zvonkin, who are gurus in theory of meanders, the notion meander was suggested by Vladimir Arnold, the two meanders were studied already by Henri Poincaré, and they appear here and there in different contexts, in particular in physics, in biology, in genomics, and so on. So and one of the main problems is the counting problem. How many you <coughs> impose the uh, bound for the number of intersections, how many different meanders can you find, up to natural equivalence relation. So I will study this problem in slightly different context, will fix, will impose extra topolo well, combinatorial constraints and count, will count meanders under this extra combinatorial constraints. Uh, and also, have you seen that this, so probably I passed it, I was so much excited with the proof that I didn't tell that uh, I'm telling something which is a joint work with Vincent Delacroix, who is here, with Elise Goujat, who hopefully will be here next week, and with Peter Zogra from St. Petersburg. So, oops, sorry. Um, let me play a little bit with this problem. First, let me chop the meander along this red curve and separate two parts, upper part and lower part. Now I have just a system of arcs on top, system of arcs on the bottom, and also one more thing which I can do is I can pass from R2 to the sphere. I just compactify everything by one point, and on the sphere, this red curve become just, becomes just a simple closed curve. Blue curve was already a simple closed curve. So in some sense, we're counting pairs of transverse simple closed curves on a sphere up to natural equivalence. Uh, of course, when I pass from this line to a closed curve, I have to take into account a marking. I have to remember where I am supposed to chop the, the red curve. But 
this is easy to encounter in this counting problem. So passing from one problem to another is elementary and I will play with this all the time without making special preparation. Now, uh, so I said that we'll impose extra combinatorial constraint on meanders and we'll count meanders satisfying this extra combinatorial constraint separately for each constraint. So I'm introducing new parameter and I will count meanders separately for different values of parameter. And the parameter is combinatorial passport of meander. So when, so when we pass to the sphere, so our red curve becomes, for example, equator of the sphere. This, this is what we see from top. This is what we see from bottom. So we have two hemispheres. And on each of the hemispheres, we have an arc system. We can construct a dual graph. And I suggest to uh, forget about all vertices of valence two of this dual graph. So let us memorize only vertices of non-trivial valence. Valence one and valence three here. So in general, this kind of meander will have many, many extra arcs here and here and here. And I forget all these vertices of valence two, which are sort of non-interesting. And I memorize only their the remaining vertices, and this would be the combinatorial passport of my meander. So for this particular meander, the combinatorial passport is Mercedes sign on top and Mercedes sign on the bottom. And I'm saying graph for sphere, actually we would have just trees. And also, I, we can do similar things in the very same way for not only for spheres, but for other surfaces, but for the sake of clarity and simplicity, I will consider only classical meanders on this field. Okay, so actually it's much easier to compute the number of arc systems on a disk, on a hemisphere, but the, and then we can compute the number of arc systems on top, the number of arc systems on the bottom, and we glue them together, and they're also the choice of a twist, but the trouble is that when we glue two arc systems together, sometimes we get meander, and sometimes we do not. So do we agree that we have exactly the same picture on top, here and here, exactly the same picture, just two arcs on top, two arcs on the bottom, but if we glue them this way, like for a tennis ball, we do get a meander, we get a pair of uh, simple closed curves which are transversely intersecting, and here our blue curve has, is a multi-curve, it has two connected components. So it is very tempting just to count arc systems on a, in a disk, but then we have to know what proportion of all possible arc systems on top, on the bottom, and gluings provide the meander. So attaching, so this is the point. So let us try to study this asymptotic frequency of pairs of compatible arc systems and gluings, uh, the frequency with which we get meanders. So we fix, let us fix the setting. So we fix two trees, which are co our combinatorial passports, uh, tree T-top, which corresponds to passport for the arc system on northern hemisphere, T-bottom, the combinatorial passport of arc system on southern hemisphere, and we consider all possible n arc systems of type T top on northern hemisphere, n arc system of type T bottom on bottom hemisphere, all possible identification, identifications, and we impose some bound capital N for the number of arcs. And we count the ratio of number of triples giving rise to meanders over total number of different triples. So if you wish, this is sort of a probability that a meander out of pair of arc systems. Or better say, frequency of appearance of meanders out of two arc systems. So the question is what can be said about asymptotics of this quantity? Yes? So the n arcs can be distributed according to the 
possible yes. for them to actually keep more not so box here and not so much here. You forgot the two valent vertices. So you can if you respect the combinatorial passport, then you can put plenty of arcs which intersect uh, some edges of our tree and say no arcs at all or one arc which yeah but you here in this setting you consider all possible arc systems where the number of arc is bounded by n the only thing you have to care is that two arc systems the arc system on top and on the bottom should be compatible they should have the same number of arcs otherwise you cannot glue them together and also you consider all possible identifications so you twist like like for the slide before so you said you love zero sorry Zero. What do you mean zero? I mean no. Uh, uh, in principle, yes, there would be not so many arc systems like this. Yes. No, no I mean then um, different. Then um, anyway, you could have different combinatorial types for the same um, uh, arc system. I see. Yes, but. This is sort of, this would be a negligible part. You see, I'm looking everything only asymptotically. So, and you are, you are going to co-dimension, non-trivial co-dimension. So what is your expectation? Is it frequent to get a meander? Is it so, sort of, it, of course there are not so many, but is it small like this or small like this? And why I ask people who already, this is not the first time when I'm giving this talk. So if you already know the answer, do not answer. Well, actually, for me, it was completely unexpected. This ratio is non-zero, always. No matter what two trees we take, the tree on top and the tree on the bottom. With non-trivial, well, with non-zero probability, you get a meander, a single connected curve. Even if you have zillion arcs on top and zillion arcs on bottom. So quite often they want to arrange in a single connected curve. And oops, and moreover, this ratio for first, it's not existence statement. We can compute this number. For example, for the two Mercedes signs which were in the picture, the answer is like this. It's approximately one third. So with probability approximately one third, you get a single connected curve, gluing two arc systems. Now, uh, I do not want to give the answer in full generality. Let me simplify. I prefer not to make passports and other travel documents as sophisticated as possible. I don't like visas and so on. Let me simplify combinatorial passports. Let me fix as the only combinatorial constraint, I will fix the total number of vertices of valency one on two trees. So I take the number of vertices of valency one, the number of leaves of my trees, tree on top, the number of leaves of my tree on the bottom, I take the total sum, and this is my parameter p. And I count all possible arc systems, compatible arc systems of the type, of this type, and I co compute the ratio as before. And the probability that we get a connected curve has this very explicit expression. So now, when we have, when we have an answer for this problem, it is not surprising that we can compute true meanders. Now I will give the answer for true meanders where we fix the same parameters. So we fix the number of these minimal arcs which are marked in black. And this is our combinatorial passport. Yeah? Uh, is the outside, the outer arc also minimal? Uh, absolutely. So if you pass to the sphere, and I wanted to cheat and uh, not to cheat, I want to make it, to provoke you, and you ruined my provocation. Uh, absolutely. So here I'm coming back to the plane, and you are absolutely right, when you will go to the sphere, this arc, which is maximal, will become minimal and will become non-distinguishable from these black ones. Absolutely. Uh, but 
provocation was I wanted, I suggested, I suggest to count separately meanders which do have this maximal arc and meanders which don't have a maximal. My maximal arc will this rainbow, meaning an arc going from the rightmost point, point to the leftmost point. So still, since it's already on the slide, I suggest to compute them separately, meanders of this type and of this type. And due to your remark, it is not surprising that, so probably for the instant, <laughs> it might be surprising that the number of meanders of this type is larger than the number of meanders of this type. We have an impression that we added an extra constraint, this maximal arc. But in reality, we added a black arc like this. So the answer, it works. It's also tied, sorry. Uh, so then the answer for the number of meanders with the rainbow, with the maximal arc, is like this. So it's polynomial in n, where n is the number of, uh, well, 2n is the number of crossings. So it's polynomial in n of this degree, and this is explicit formula for the coefficient of this polynomial. And when there is no maximal arc, it's also polynomial in n, but you see it's the power of this polynomial is by one, well, sort of, the, the leading term is, has polynomial asymptotics, but the power is by one unit less than here. Okay, so it was, the beginning was to impress you, and now I have to tell how can one count meanders, and I, the choice of the subject, there were two reasons for the choice of the subject. So first is that the last talk of Maria Mirzahani, which I attended, it was colloquium talk given in Berkeley, uh, and I don't remember whether it was two or three years ago. She spoke about meanders. And at this time, I had no idea why she's speaking about meanders and what she wants to do with meanders. And now I see that, I guess that she wanted to do something of this kind because they are very closely related to what she did for simple closed curves. And I will also try to show how her ideas work extremely efficiently in other stories, in particular in this story for meanders. So that was the, the second motivation. And also I wanted to tell something fun in the last, question, in the last lecture. So let me... I need the following, I, I need some uh, background, and this background is uh, major reach volumes of the spaces of not hyperbolic surfaces, but of flat surfaces. So I consider the moduli space of pairs, complex curve C, and holomorphic one form omega, and I impose in addition that this holomorphic one form, which has 2g minus two zeros, on a curve of genus G, so counted on multiplicities, that this holomorphic one form has zeros of degrees M1, etc., MN. So you see, I, so I claim that I don't want, doc, I don't like documents and passports. Once again, I am imposing sort of a combinatorial password. I'm imposing very specific degrees of zeros. So in modular space like this is called a stratum, and this is really a stratum in their total space of a g-dimensional vector bundle over the moduli space of curves. If you consider holomorphic, if you consider Riemann surface, there is a g-dimensional vector space of holomorphic forms on it. So I take, we get a vector bundle of the moduli space, I take out the zero section and I stratify this total uh, space of this vector bundle by its strata. Similarly, to the way you can stratify the space of polynomials. If you have polynomial of degree three, then usually it has three distinct zeros, but it can have double zero and simple zero, or it can, has, can have just one triple zero, and this is exactly the same kind of stratification. Now, what is nice is this strata are modeled on this cohomology group. So if we have a holomorphic form like this, we can, of course, as we can associate to this holomorphic one form uh, it's closed, and we can associate to it the, its cohomology class, but since we fix the number of zeros, we can consider integrals 
of our holomorphic one form not only along closed cycles, but also along cycles joining these distinguished points, which are zeros of our form. And we get a cohomology class and this relative cohomology group relative with respect to these n points where we place the zeros. And I'm not proving this, but actually this space serves as local coordinates in our model space. So when you change the cohomology classes in this space, you change everything. You change complex structure, you change holomorphic form, but still we get local coordinates in this stratum. And now you already see that it's my favorite object. So we have something which is sort of piecewise linear, and we have integer lattice in this space because we can consider cohomology with coefficients in z plus iz. This provides me a lattice. As soon as I have something which is locally modeled on a vector space, and I have distinguished lattice in this vector space, I have distinguished Lebesgue measure. I just choose the linear volume form on my vector space, and I choose the normalization such that the fundamental domain of my lattice has volume one. So I have distinguished volume element in every stratum. This is very similar to Thurston's measure or Mirzahani's measure. We'll see basically analogs of both of them shortly. Now we have analog of length function. Namely, we can measure the flat surface. So we can associate to our one form flat metric and we can measure the area of the surface in terms of this metric. So, or if you don't want to see flat metric, just compute the integral of omega wedge omega bar multiplied by i over 2. And as a matter of fact, this expression, th this integral can be expressed in terms of absolute period. So we get sort of, a, so if we consider the uh, hypersurface, the real hypersurface of um, constant value of this function, we get something which resembles a unit hyperboloid in this space. Uh, the volume of this space measured, of all this space, of all the stratum measured with respect to our measure is of course infinite, but if we take the set of lower values of this function, uh, then by oops, by theorem of Mazur and Vich, the volume of such set of lower values is finite. And another way to see instead of taking sort of the volume of unit ball here, traditionally, one evaluates the hypersur hypersurface area of this unit hyperboloid. One is related to another just by dimensional constant zones, so like area over sphere and volume of a ball, they are related just by my multiplying by dimensional constant. This is a matter of convention. What is important is that it is finite. Now, I have to remind one more time how one computes, so we need, so this is our unit hyperboloid, and we want to compute either area of this part of hyperboloid or up to multiplying by dimensional constant the volume of a cone based on this part of hyperboloid, how can we do it? Well, as before, we use sort of a square lattice, we count the number of points, we normalize, we take the grid which is small and smaller, pass to the limit, we have computed the volume. Okay. And equivalently, we can pass to, we can, instead of taking unit hyperboloid, as here we took, we passed from ball of radius one to ball of radius L, we can pass to hyperboloid of, sort of, of which corresponds to value of our function equal to N, and count the number of integer points inside the cone based on part of this hyperboloid. It is equivalent. Okay. Now, this is just general nonsense. How can one compute volume? But here, um, also sort of similarly to this story, one can provide, one has 
nice interpretation of integer points in our space. So I claim that, recall that our space is not just abstract space modeled on some vector space. It is space of pairs, Riemann surface plus holomorphic one form. What does it mean that holomorphic one form represents an integer point in our space? By definition, it means that all periods of this holomorphic one form, absolute and relative, live in z plus iz. Relative meaning that if you take a path joining two zeros and you integrate our form with respect to this path, the result is an integer number plus i integer number. I claim that this enables to construct a canonical cover from our Riemann surface of our Riemann surface over a standard torus glued from a unit square in the plane C. And the construction is straightforward. So fix one of the zeros, one of these points, for example, P1. Uh, this is one of the zeros of our holomorphic one form. So fix it once and forever. Now, having any point of my Riemann surface, I send it to the following complex number, taken mod z plus iz. So I'm, I will associate to this point a number, a complex number mod z plus iz, meaning that I associate to it, to my point p, a point of the torus. So the number is evaluated as, as follows. I join my distinguished zero p1 with my point p by any path, and I compute integral of omega mod z plus iz. You would say, well, your definition depends on the path. There is no canonical way to choose the path, absolutely. But you can choose any path. Because if you choose, choose two different paths, then the difference of our calculation would be an integral over a closed path. An integral over a closed path is absolute period, and absolute period is in z plus iz. We mod out z plus iz, so no matter what path you choose, if you compute this integral mod z plus iz, it's well defined. So we get a natural map from our surface to the torus, meaning that we can, so we really represent our torus as something which is glued from a unit square, and we can take this unit square and pull it back to our surface, and we get tiling of our surface with unit squares. So our surface is square tiled, any integer point uh, in this space represents, corresponds to some square tiled surface. So here is an example of square tiled surface there. Uh, the, and from now on, you can forget all complex geometry which I used. So basically, the problem of computing this maze of each volumes is reduced to the following combinatorial problem. You are given one milliard squares, uh, unit squares, where you mark on each square what is vertical direction and what is horizontal direction. If you want to construct holomorphic one form, you also orient them. If you want to construct quadratic differential, you do not orient vertical and, holomorphic, uh, and horizontal direction. And then you construct using your, at the most, n squares, you construct all possible animals like this, uh, corresponding to given combinatorial password. And given combinatorial password means the following. So mostly, you attach at a vertex four squares like this. But at several finite number of very distinguished points, you attach not four squares, but say eight squares or 12 squares and so on. These points correspond, this would, these points correspond to conical points of our flat metric or in terms of holomorphic one form, they represent zeros of our holomorphic one form or quadratic differential. So this is our counting problem and know that this problem is sort of a version of problem of counting Hurwitz numbers. Okay, now what is known about these volumes? What is known about this counting problem? I already formulated the theorem of Mazur and Veach that it is well defined, that these volumes are well defined. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I said counting problem. So 
will obtain the following. It is, so this Mazovich problem, uh, Mazovich theorem is sort of equivalent to the statement that we'll get uh, polynomial asymptotics for the number of animals, where power of the polynomial is dimension of the stratum, and the leading coefficient is basically up to normalization, up to dimensional co normalization constant is exactly our uh, Mazur-Rich volume. So what is known about this Mazur-Rich volume? So if you count your animals reasonably, and this is one of the important things which I learned after getting involved in the counting problems, when you count objects, please always do count them with the weight which is one over uh, order of the symmetry group. Your counting function instantly becomes much nicer and if your problem is natural, it has beautiful analytic problems, uh, properties. So for example, here, if you count your animals with such weight and if you create a generating function multiplying uh, their number of n exactly n square tile surfaces, not at most n, but exactly n square tile surfaces. You multiply it by formal parameter q power n, you take the sum from 1 to infinity, you get a function which is quasi-modular form. So this is a theorem of Eskin and Okunkov, and generalized to quadratic differentials by Eskin, Okunkov, and Pandery Pander, and this allows to prove that the Mazurich volume of every connected component of every stratum is a rational multiple of pi power 2g. Now, the story, the development of this story was that Askin implemented this theorem to an algorithm allowing to compute volumes. All volumes were computed up to genus 10 and for some strata like the principal one up to genus 200. And based on these calculations, we developed a conjecture for large genus asymptotics. Now, Dawi Chen, Martin Muller, and Don Zagir can compute the volume of the principal stratum up to genus 2000s and more explicitly, and they prove the conjecture for large genus asymptotics, and they have the ex explicit expansion in terms of 1 over g of all error terms. So they know everything about, about volume of the principal stratum and its asymptotics when genus grows. Now, several, several weeks ago, uh, Amal Agarwal proved the asymptotic formula for all strata, and Adrien Sauvage, who is coming next week, recently suggested a conjectural formula for the major rich volumes of all strata of abelian differentials through intersection numbers. And this is work in progress. Now, still computing the vol volumes, these volumes is not so easy. So it's an algorithm and so on. And there is one exceptional case. As always, genus zero, zero is exceptional. Most of the things are easy in genus zero. So in genus zero, one can provide just an explicit formula, a closed explicit formula for the volume, uh, which was conjectured by Konsevich and proved many years later by J. Deva Threer, Alex Seskin, and myself. So consider the following function of the uh, natural number. So define it, so we'll define V of minus 1 and V of 0 by hands. V of minus 1 is 1, V of 0 is equal to 2. And for all natural numbers, positive integer numbers, V of n as the, is defined as follows. So we take the product n times n minus 2, etc., up to have positive integer numbers, and here similar product, so this is double factorials, and we multiply it by pi power n, and we multiply it by pi or by 2, depending on the parity of n. Very explicit function, right? What are double factorial? Sorry? What double factorial? Double factorial is n times for numerator, n times n minus 2 times n minus 4, etc. So, and Similarly, for denominator n plus 1 times n minus 1 times n minus 3, etc., up to where we can get, go. So it's, so it's sort of only even all product of only even numbers and which are, <coughs> which are less than n. Yes. Yes. Uh, what is the value of 
uh, claim the volume of strata of meromorphic quadratic differentials with at most simple zeros, so the number of animals like this animal which was on the blackboard, can be really computed explicitly, and the corresponding coefficient there, the major reach volume, is given by this formula. So we have to take the degree, so we encode simple pole by degree, it's zero of minus one, and other d's are true degrees of zeros. So when we have a stratum like this, when we indicate the number of simple poles and the number and types of zeros, we just evaluate this function v for every entry. We take their product and we multiply by global normalizing constant 2 pi. Yes? Say it again. Why do you say it's the same thing as counting animals when the differentials are meromorphic? Uh, because, let me show you the animal. Yeah, so this is a simple pole. So the place where instead of gluing four squares, you glue only two squares. So you take two squares, you glue them together, and you create a pocket gluing now these two sides. So when you have a point where there are only two squares which are attached, the conical point with the angle pi, this correspond, corresponds to simple pole of our quadratic differential. And saying that I can consider meromorphic quadratic differentials, I have to impose the condition that I consider at most simple poles. Because otherwise, I wouldn't have I would have, I would get the surface of infinite area. But I can afford simple poles. And for, for a sphere, uh, there are no holomorphic differentials on CP1, and quadratic differentials are forced to have poles. My restriction is that at most simple poles. Only simple poles. Okay, now let me study these animals a little bit in more details. So when we have an animal like this, we can consider the decomposition of this animal in the maximal cylinders filled with horizontal trajectories. So here we have a cylinder like this. Here, here, this would be one more cylinder. So we'll, we decompose our animal into flat cylinders filled with horizontal geodesics. And we can count how many cylinders do we have. And I want to count separately animals which are created from one cylinder, from two cylinders, etc. The number of cylinders is bounded by topology. Now, this is count for particular stratum. So this one of the simplest strata is genus 3. One zero of degree 3 and another zero is simple. And I counted the frequencies of appearance of one cylinder, two cylinder, three and four cylinder square tile surfaces. So I'm claiming that for this stratum, uh, a square tile surface can have one, two, three or four cylinders and other number of cylinders are forbidden. <coughs> and I compute contribution to the volume separately of one cylinder square tile surfaces, two cylinder square tile surfaces and so on. Here I divide it by the total contribution of all so it's really frequencies. And you see, you can already see that the only answer which is sort of, which much simpler than others, is for the number of one cylinder square tile surfaces. And indeed, it is much easier to compute. And in general, it is not proved yet that all these frequencies are expressible in multiple zeta values. And the expert in this story, the person who knows probably the more is Vincent de la Croix sitting uh, in the middle. Uh, so the only thing, this slide, the only information which carries this slide is that counting these contributions explicitly is nasty, and that the only thing which is sort of easy to count is contribution of one cylinder square tile surface. And easy, it is relatively easy. So we have, for example, very good estimates due to the work of uh, Don Zagir, and 
basically it's his combinatorial reformulation of his result on computation of orbifold Euler characteristic of the moduli space. So easy in the sense that it's, it can be, it's doable. Okay, now I'm arriving to my main ingredient which I need for, to count meanders. Anton, in the previous slide, the, 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 the bottom also looks not too terrible, the last line, and maybe it's possible. It becomes nastier when you go okay. further. Okay, so now I suggest to do the following thing. Uh, you all realize that I love to take grids in, in the sets, in the main. So let's take an open domain in our stratum. Now I'm no, not anymore on the unit hyperboloid. I'm taking the entire stratum in which I have my major reach volume element. And I take an open domain, open relatively close domain in the stratum. And I'm considering epsilon grids in my domain. And we have seen, we have seen that any integer points corresponds to a square tiled surface. But a point of an epsilon grid also corresponds to a square tiled surface, except that now the square tiled surface is tiled with squares epsilon times epsilon. So we have plenty, we have finite number of this integer of these square tile surfaces, epsilon square tile surfaces, which got into our open domain. And we can count how many of them are one cylinder, two cylinder, three cylinder, and so on. Theorem. When we make epsilon tend to zero, the asymptotic frequencies do not depend on the domain. They're one and the same for all domains and the same for the entire stratum. Proof. Basically, it is very similar to this thing. So I claim that if you construct not the Mazur-Witch measure, which, is, which was constructed using all integer points, but if I will construct a measure using only integer points corresponding to, say, one cylinder square tile surfaces, the measure which, we, which I will get would be proportional to Mazur-Witch volume, uh, to Mazur-Witch measure, with some constant coefficient, no zero constant coefficient, which is the ratio of contributions of one cylinder square tile surfaces to the entire volume. And proof, uh, our set of one cylinder Square unit square tile surfaces is invariant under the action of horocyclic group plus ergodicity. Basically, it's, it's just, I'm not saying that it's the proof, I'm saying that this is an idea of the proof, but it comes from invariance under a large group plus ergodicity. And this is, so we were looking for this argument for many years, and finally we found the proof reading the paper of Marim. So, because it mimics this argument. Okay, one more result. To be fair, I, up to now I considered only decomposition to horizontal cylinders. One can consider decomposition to vertical cylinders. It's completely analogous. One can consider the following thing. So now, let us fix let us consider only square tile surfaces he having, for example, G horizontal cylinders, or what is, uh, no, G vertical cylinders. And let us count how many out of them have K horizontal cylinders. So I'm computing sort of a conditional probability. What is the, prob the probability to get a square tile surface with K horizontal cylinders? Taken that, we impose it to it to have G vertical cylinders. Claim this conditional probability is the same as, as initial probability. So there is no correlation between two distributions. OK, note that this is already useful to count approximately the volumes. And sort of to get numerical estimates. And the idea is the following. So just take 
an open domain, which is convenient, and choose integer points by random and collect with a computer, collect statistics, how often do you see one cylinder, two cylinder, and so on, and cylinder square tile surfaces. So memorize this. And then compute explicitly the true contribution of one cylinder square tile surfaces to the volume. Just compute the number of one cylinder square tile surfaces. I try to assure, uh, assure you that it is easier problem. It's easier to compute one cylinder square tile surfaces. This can be done rigorously and explicitly. But if you know the true contribution of one cylinder square tile surfaces and, a prog and you know experimentally that they are frequency, you divide one over the other and you get approximate value of the volume. So this is the way to compute the volume using Monte Carlo method. Okay, and it was really used to debug numerical results. Now I'm already ready to tell you how can one count meanders. Now I have to slow down a little bit. It's just one slide. It's very easy. But first observation. I claim that, so, We'll count meanders in the following setting. So now I will use interpretation of a meander as pair of transversally intersecting simple closed curves on a sphere, where I know which curve is red and which curve is blue. And I want to count the number of pairs of transversally intersecting simple closed curves, which intersect by at most n points, up to deform so and I can see the pairs up to deformorphism. Instead of considering only pairs of simple closed curves, let us consider pairs of multicurves. Let us consider all possible multicurves, which are trans so red multicurve, blue multicurve, and I claim I, I require that they intersect transversely. What is a pair of transversely intersecting multicurves? I claim that it's exactly the same object as a square tile surface. Why? Just take a dual graph and you'll get square tile surface. It is easier to see it, it's bijection, and it is easier to go from a square tile surface to a pair of transversely intersecting multicurves. Namely, take any square and draw a red line passing through through the center of the square, we'll get a closed curve, and draw a blue circle passing through the center of the square vertically. By construction, we'll get P of multicurves, transversally intersecting, and this is the way to go this direction. And to go other direction, just consider dual graph of this thing, and you'll get the square tile surface. So this is the first observation. That means that we know how to count all square tile surfaces of given combinatorial type. This is Mazur-Rich volume and genus zero. We have very explicit formula for this. So we know how to compute all multicurves. Now, another thing is one can compute those pairs of multicurves where one multicurve corresponds to uh, one multicurve is just a simple closed curve, and another, the vertical one, is some multicurve. This is square, this corresponds to square tile surfaces having single horizontal cylinder. I'm not giving you the answer, but I try to convince you that it's much easier to compute one cylinder square tile surface. So this is doable. So we have computed already two quantities but not the one which we're interested in. We want to compute those which have one horizontal cylinder and one vertical cylinder. But now we'll use our non-correlation result. So we have seen that if we know, so I can, I'll, if I have two out of three quantities, I have relation between them, the number of square root surfaces which have one horizontal and one vertical cylinder is expressed in terms of the two numbers which we ha have computed. By this formula, we get the answer. End of the story. So we see multi-curves, volumes, and so on. And let me now, to, let me think, sorry, I'm, I will be three minutes late, but now I can rush. I told the, 
the idea of the proof, and now I would like to tie this story with what we discussed in the first two lectures. So recall that, um, so can, I would like to make, to pass from hyperbolic surfaces and simple closed, uh, and multi-curves on uh, hyperbolic surfaces to flat surfaces. So if we have a multi-curve like this, and this is really multi-curve with weights, so I have weight here, weight two here, and weight two here. I can associate to this multi-curve a square tile surface, and the weight, <coughs> so the curves correspond to horizontal cylinders, and the weight is responsible for the height of the cylinder. So the fact that there is weight two here means that this cylinder has weight, uh, height two, and it's really like weight of our simple closed geodesics how many of them have, we have. So it's sort of, we measure them with a weight which represents the width of the band of simple closed geodesics. And of course, we can associate many square tile surfaces to this picture, it's not unique. This time, the association is not unique. We can construct many, many square tile surfaces representing this multi-curve. Now, recall that now I'm using this color, curl line. So we, Mirzahani, computed frequencies of simple closed hyperbolic geodesics of this type and of that type, and she proved during the, uh, using this corollary that the ratio does not depend on hyperbolic metric and is expressible uh, in terms of, is expressible by explicit rational fractions like here. So the ratio of these guy guys and these guys is four thirds claim. If you consider all possible square tiled surfaces tiled with at most n squares of this type, or choose any other multicurve and of this type, or choose any other integer multicurve, and take the limit of the ratio when number of squares tends to, to, to infinity, the limit would be exactly the same. So in this sense, in this interpretation rather, the frequencies of hyperbolic geodesics and of flat geodesics are the same. Now, what happens if we take simple closed curve on a closed surface, for example, of genus 2, and compute the number of separating simple closed geodesics and non-separating? So, in Mariam's paper, the answer is one, so this is an answer from Mariam's paper, it is absolutely correct. The answer in Mariam's paper for this case is 1 over 6, uh, and if you correct a tiny bug in her calculation, she puts at some point two, not in uh, denominator, but in numerator, you get one over 24. If you correct one more tiny bug, which is really nasty, you get one over 48. And I'm showing this one over 48, not to diminish Mariam's results. I am fascinated that she obtained basically Many numerical results are absolutely correct without debugging, but unfortunately it's repeated too often. Please do not reproduce this 1 over 6. It's not 1 over 6, it's 1 over 48. Now I'm sort of really confident in this because it was verified by many people in different ways. And a natural question is, and what will happen if we'll pass to genus which is large? whether we'll have more separating or non-separating simple closed geodesics in flat sense or in hyperbolic sense. Now, the answer is it is computable, and the answer is that basically you would never see separating simple closed geodesics in large genus. If you take a geodesic by random, it would be non-separating. The ratio of these frequencies behaves as 1 over 4 power g. They appear extremely rarely. And the very last question is, what is Lagenus asymptotics? So let us consider the, uh, cr the several multicurves like this, where I just chop k out of g handles, and I count corresponding frequencies. And this is my last slide. So I claim that, so this is sort of, experimental behavior of these things. 
And I also claim that we have seen that this quantity BGN uh, is, or BG in this case, to n is equal to zero. BG represents the Maser-Rich volume of uh, the principal stratum of quadratic differentials in genus G. So, exp and this BG is computed using plenty of different multicurves, and there are zillions of them because you consider partial pairs of Penn's decompositions. There are many, many multicurves which you can get. I claim that you can forget basically all of them except the simplest ones, and the volume sits only on these graphs. The other do not really contribute. And this is the last thing of this story. So it was a pleasure to present results of Mariam. I drew them extremely beautiful. And in this last lecture, I tried to show that they're living. They, they're used all the time. They appear here and there. And we'll see, for, I'm sure that we'll see further manifestations of her results and further interpretations and further ties. And the only thing which I regret is that well, she's not there. And she, she in, imagined many paths in the mountains. And, and, but she couldn't do them. So, OK, thank you for your attention.